So uh, we'd like to open uh, the afternoon talking about building a detection lab with Security Onion. And so for that, I give you Wiley Bayes. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me OK? All right, great. I'm here to talk to you today about how, to, how I built um, a detection lab with Security Onion for a class um, of new analysts. Um, and I'm going to go over exactly how I did all that. Um, if you want to follow along, I've got links to the slides here at the bottom. Um, if you want to pull that up on your own computer, you can. So who am I? Um, my name is Wiley Bays. I was in the Navy early on, right out of high school. Did IT stuff in the Navy. Um, I've been in IT for 15 plus ish years. I'm, I'm good. I'm going to go try to deal with it. Done hey, lots Raha. of systems engineering, virtualization, storage, and security work. Um, I was a network defense analyst at the Missile uh, Defense Agency, which is a certified T2 CSSP for quite a while. Um, and like I said, I currently teach Air Force personnel how to be defensive cyber operators. Um, I've got a BS in computer network management and some certs, yada, yada, yada. Um, so what are we covering today? We're going to talk about our lab architecture, which is an extremely important piece to this talk. If we don't understand the lab architecture, it's going to be kind of confusing. Um, so we're going to hammer that home pretty hard. Um, next, we're going to talk about the services and routing and firewalling that are provided in this lab by a single OpenBSD machine. Um, and then we're going to go over some VMware configurations to make this all work. Um, and then we're going to talk about creating and executing scenarios um, and how those can be mixed and matched, intertwined, changed out at will, depending on what you're trying to detect or what scenario you're trying to create. Um, and then we're going to go over analyzing our results. And then we're going to talk about how you can turn all of this into a blue team CTF and how I was able to do that for students. And uh, it really resonated with them as far as like actually doing investigations um, and figuring out all this stuff as new analysts because it's, it's hard. Um, and then if we have time, we'll, we'll take some questions. So the environment. This is what I used to set all this up. Um, I use VMware vCenter ESXi 6.5 with distributed switching. Uh, at the time, I used OpenBSD 6.3, but um, all of this should be forward compatible all the way up to 6.5 and 6.6 uh, 6 current, which should be out in November. Um, at the time, also, I used Security Onion 6.1. I know that it's up a couple of versions since then, but. Um, at the time when I used or set all this up and made all these slides, I was using Security Onion 6.1. And then various other machines, Kali, Windows, Linux, lots of other VMs in the environment just for uh, the purposes of having something to uh, exploit and detect. So here's our logical topology. Um, up in the top left corner is our simulated public internet. The little, the, the scary red cloud, right? Um, and I know this is kind of hard to see, but these slides are available offline, and you can drill down and look at all of the specifics on this. Um, but the firewall, the brick wall machine, basically is the most important piece to this logical op architecture. It is an OpenBSD machine, and it holds all of the dot one gateway interfaces for every subnet, OK? So we have n 99 5.1, 10.99 6.1, 10.99 7.1, 10.99 8.1, and then our quote unquote public address on the internet is 172.16.10.1. Does that make sense to everybody? I know that's a private address, but for the purposes of this course, I kept it private because I didn't want anything to ac accidentally leak out to the internet. So for the purposes of this course, 172.16.10.1 is our public facing address. And then the purple line is a port mirror that we set up inside of VMware that goes to Security Onion. It takes all that traffic, anything that's traversing subnets in between subnets, it takes all of that traffic and mirrors it over to our Security Onion instance so it can see everything. 
Uh, these green boxes in the middle here are um, just client networks. This is 1099, 7, and 8 on the left, and 1099, 6 on the right with a bunch of servers. There's a domain controller in there. There's a couple member servers, a bunch of Windows 10 machines. Um, that's our CTFD servers in there as well. So there's just a bunch of various clients out in there to, to work with. Now, finally, over here on the right um, is our ports, protocols, and services, as we call it in the DOD community. Um, but what we're going to do here, and for new analysts, this is not necessarily all that apparent, right? If you're looking at this, and this is our boundary, and it's going to show you these are the ports that are open on our boundary, and those are the machines that we're going to point them to internally, right? So a couple things there should be pretty glaring to a lot of us here, I'm sure. But to new analysts, it's not necessarily super apparent. So this is where we try to, to dive in and help them with that. Um, OK, so moving on. OpenBSD, route and firewall, all the things, right? Woo. Uh, I also have stickers if anybody wants one after. Um, so these are the services and configurations supported by this one firewall machine that we've been talking about. Uh, it's got PF, packet filter, which is absolutely necessary for this to work. Um, we've got our sysctl IP forwarding. That's just a configuration item that allows NAT to happen. Um, we've got DHCP. This server also hands out DHCP to all of those different subnets to clients on those networks. Uh, it's the DHCP server for all that. It's also our NTP server for the entire network. It listens for uh, NTP on all interfaces, so it provides timing to the entire lab. Um, and then we've got an rc.local file. This is where you can um, create some, uh, some commands that will get started up when the machine boots. So we have a custom TCP dump rule to get all of our packet filtered to our security onion. OK, so where were we? Um, rc.local is the file we use to create a custom TCP dump rule that sends all of our packet filter data, which is our firewall data, into our security onion. Um, and then finally, rcconf.local, just make sure that our other services are starting up, like DHCP. PFLogD, NTPD, et cetera. So here again is just an output of the OpenBSD IF config on the command line, and also a snippet of the logical diagram where the firewall shows all the interfaces, right? So we have all those interfaces, and here's just the output of that. Um, highlighting here in the middle are 172.16.10.1 is our EM3 interface, right? So we've got EM0 through EM5, but EM3 is our boundary interface for this, for this presentation. OK, so inside of our hostname file on EM3, our primary interface here is 172.16.10.1, which we talked about. However, you can then add aliases to these interfaces, which are sub-interfaces in OpenBSD, same thing. Um, but then this is where you can just slap on a ton of extra IP ranges and target the public address from these other addresses. It looks like the source address that's, being, that's coming into your network and attacking your boundary is actually one of these IPs way out on the internet. And you can just make this up, and all the geo-mapping inside of a Security Onion will tell you, oh, this came from North Korea, or this came from wherever. Um, so, <clears throat> and this is pretty seamless to the user, to the, to the student. They can't really see this. And you can add pretty much as many of these as you'd like. Uh, so this could be, there could be 100 entries, 1,000 entries in here. Define as many IP networks as you want, um, really. So that's what that looks like for our host name, for our boundary. Now let's talk about our pf.conf file. This is kind of where all the magic happens. Um, at the top here, we've just defined our interfaces. These are just comments, and they tell you what they're for. Uh, I bolded the EM3, again, to highlight our external boundary interface. 
Next, we've got just some basic pass rules to pass out everything. Note again, logging on EM3, because we want to log everything at the boundary. Um, then we block some annoying IGMP just to cut down on the chatter. And then finally, the block at the very bottom, or the rule at the very bottom is our default block. Uh, again, log on EM3. We always want to log at our boundary. Um, Next, we've got just a few rules to block, um, either block or allow traffic from some scanners that we had in the environment. But the next section, the custom firewall rules, this is where this is going to map out exactly to what our ports, protocols, and services are that we talked about from the diagram. So if you look at this first one that's bolded, pass in log EM3 from any to EM3 port 22, and then redirect that to 10.99.6.21 on port 22. So it's going to take that traffic at our boundary and forward it to our internal machine, which is 10.99.6.21. And if you look at all those, it maps out exactly to what our ports, protocols, and services were that we highlighted in the beginning. Um, EM3, port 445, redirect to 10.99.6.32 on port 445. Um, 10.99.6.27 for port 6667 and 3622. And then down at the bottom, this is actually commented out, but that's another scenario that I had set up that was like an OWASP um, broken web applications VM that I was doing some testing against. So you can just open these up. You can open these up and point them at whatever machines internally that you'd like to create different aspects. Like say you want to play around with shell shock. So you open a port, point it at the box that's vulnerable to shell shock, attack it from out in the simulated public internet. It runs all that traffic, runs through your sensors, runs through everything, creates all the logs for you. Um, and then you get to see it live. It's not just like replaying a PCAP or, you know, it's all live. Um, so finally, bear with me. We've just got, we're going to allow syslog everywhere. We're going to allow DNS. And then these were just student access rules that I used to control access to certain portions of the course. Like I only wanted students to be able to get on the CTFD server on Friday when we were going to do the CTF. I didn't want them poking around in there until it was time to do that. So with these rules on the last page are just ways that you can lock things down from if you were conducting a course. Um, so that's basically it for our pf.conf. Now let's talk about VMware. This is real simple. So inside of vCenter on your distributed switch, there's a configure tab with a port mirroring section. So, and all you would have to do is click the, the new button there and it would pop up a little dialog that looks like this. And you give it a name, it's enabled. Um, the only thing that I actually changed on this was I changed my mirrored packet length to 512. I found that that gave me the best results where I was getting very minimal capture loss on, on Security Onion. Um, and I had really good results with that. So next thing is you just define your sources. So here's our OpenBSD machine that's doing all of our routing for us. And I want to mirror these three interfaces on it. One of them is our public. The other two are internal subnets that will capture, and if any of the other subnets talk to anything in these mirrored subnets, it ends up hitting the security center anyway. Um, so define your sources. I want those. Destination, our security onion. And that's just going to be our actual capture interface that we're monitoring on security onion. All right, so We've got all this great network data now, right? We can see everything. All this bro traffic's coming across. We can see every connection that's happening. One computer talks to another computer on two different subnets. We've got all of this log traffic now in Security Union, right? That's great. Like, sweet. That's great. However, we all like more data, right? Let's get more data, like, so that these analysts can really have a bunch of juicy logs to look at, and they can really do full investigations or practice investigations this way. Um, so next, we pushed all of the syslog data that we could into Security Onion from our OpenBSD firewall router, um, from a web server that we had internally, all the data from our ESXi hosts we just pushed up in there. 
um, data from Tenable Security Center, data from H or, uh, McAfee EPO. And then finally, I mentioned that custom TCP dump rule uh, that we put into the rc.conf file, and it looks just like this. And all this is doing here is monitoring the PF log zero interface, which is basically um, just an interface in OpenBSD that anything that's, that you tell it to log in your pf.conf file will output to this interface. And you can TCP dump it just like any other interface. Um, and then I pipe that to logger and send it to uh, syslog, which local info to here will be all of our firewall data coming from PF. And then down at the bottom, that's just the one entry inside of your syslog.conf where you send all of the, the different messages and at the host that you want it to go to. In this case, 10996.10 is my security center. Or I mean my, my security onion, I'm sorry. Okay, so we got all that great syslog data now, right? And <coughs> that's just awesome. Like We're really getting there. We really got some good data now. But we want more. Let's keep going, let's keep going. Let's get all of our sysmon data in there now, right? And our Windows event log data, because we have all those Windows machines in that subnet too. We have a domain controller, we've got member servers, we've got Windows 10 clients, like we need to get all that Windows data too, right? So here's a real simple um, win log beat configuration screenshot of just getting application security, Microsoft Windows PowerShell operational, task scheduler operational, and our sysmon logs. That's everything that I wanted to capture off of the Windows host and send it security onion. So here's the configuration file that does that. Obviously, you guys probably already know, it sends it in JSON over TCP 544. And for sysmon, um, I started out with Swift on security. Um, that's his Twitter handle. Uh, but they've got a great configuration to start with and then you can kind of tweak it from there. But if you, if you don't know Swift on security, he's got really, really, really good Sysmon stuff out there. Um, so check that out. All right, great. So now we've got all of our Windows logs coming in, and we've got all of our syslog data coming in, and we've got all of our network traffic. Great, so now it's almost like these analysts have pure visibility in this network. Doesn't sound like there's too much missing. Also, our Sysmon data is so rich. It's so rich. I don't know if you've ever looked at Sysmon data before, but if you haven't, you should, because it's, it's rich. And I'm, these are just examples of that. This is like a process create command. Shows you, you know, what image was spawned, where it, what user spawned it, session IDs, login GUID IDs. Like, it, it's, it's very, very rich data. If you haven't played with Sysmon, you really should. All right, so let's talk about how we're going to create scenarios. Again, um, hammering this home because we really want this to be important. This is, again, our, our ports, protocols, and services. Our traffic is mirrored across all subnets. Um, it's mirrored from the simulated pub public internet, and these are the ports that are open at our boundary and going internal to our machines. And these can be changed and mix, mixed and matched at will that I mentioned earlier. Um, so now let's look at it from the other side. Let's, let's be the bad guy out in the public internet and see if this matches up to what our configuration says it should match up to, right? So here's just an example of an, an in-map result from scanning our public address, which is 172.16.10.1 from the outside. Um, as you can see, we've got port 22, 80, 445, 3632, and 6667. Oops. Now, you can't tell where those are going or that, you, or that this isn't all one single machine. The attacker doesn't know that this goes to five different machines internally or whatever. Um, but the ports match up to what we talked about. What we have open is what's open. So, as we can see, we've got 445, SMB, which is really bad, right? Um, Unreal IRCD on port 6667. 
uh, whatever this 3632 dist CCD is, who even knows what that is, right? Um, so, as you can see, there's like a few things that should be super glaring, especially to uh, experienced folks, but new analysts still might not, this might not be clicking for them, that 445 open on your boundary is not a good thing, you know? So, so let's see what this looks like. Let's slang some exploits. So we already know that 445 SMB is open at our boundary. 6667 is open at our boundary. There's perfectly good exploits within Metasploit that will just take care of this for us. So let's see what happens. Here's a screenshot of just running Eternal Blue against our 172.16.10 address. You don't need to read all this. It's, it's not necessarily that important. It's just a screenshot of how the exploit runs and looks. But at the bottom there, that's it popping a system shell. So the exploit worked. Now we have a system shell on that box. Um, so let's look at this from, uh, from Squirt. We see here we've got multiple different alerts that popped. We've got CMD shell on local system. CMD shell open on local system, eternal blue MS 1710, couple of those. Here's the exact same alerts in Kibana, right? Here it is for Unreal IRCD, same type of thing. This is just a super cheesy, simple snort rule that detects Etsy shadow in the clear. But this is an example of, okay, I have this certain attack vector that an attacker might use, right? Um, I'm gonna create this scenario in my lab. I'm gonna open it up to where this service is available and then I'm going to attack it and I am then able to write custom, not only write custom snort rules, but tune them, tune your queries in Kibana, tune your visualizations, tune your dashboards to where you're playing with this stuff and figuring it out in your lab environment before you can, before you port it all over into production. Um, or if you're teaching a course um, for students, it's very, very, very lucrative in a classroom environment as far as I've had experience with. Uh, so there, there it is in Squirt. Again, same exact uh, alert in Kibana. Just two different ways to view it, right? Lots of different ways. Um, and then all the things Kibana. You get all this great... So now let's talk about how we can turn all this into a CTF, right? So we've got the perfect environment. We see everything. We log everything. Every connection that happens from the simulated public internet to any internal machine crossing over our firewall boundary is getting mirrored to our security onion. We have bro logs for every connection that happens. And then we get all the, the rich sysmon and syslog data. If uh, I need to talk to Josh later and get the OS query integrated into this too. Um, but you have all this wonderful data now. So the artifacts are all there. The artifacts for running an entire vest investigation from start to finish are all there. From the time you scan that IP with InMap to when you first make that initial connection to exploit that exploit or that service, everything's gonna show up in Security Onion. So then, um, I'm sure you've all used CTFD, you've probably heard of it. Um, tons of conferences use it for hosting CTFs. It's a great platform, it's open source, free. Um, so I gotta give credit to them. But what you can do now is, <coughs> I turned all of this into a capture the flag for my students. Starting off with, let's say, at the top, 
the remote code execution one is the eternal blue, and the remote code execution two is the Unreal IRCD. And they're two completely different exploit paths, right? They're two completely different compromises. And they came from different source IPs. They're two completely separate compromises. But the new analysts in my courses would have to figure that out. And that would be how they do it through this CTF. We would ask them questions like, you know, what was the source IP that first compromised the original host? And then from there, like, what was the destination port that was compromised? Or what was the um, code name given to that exploit? Or you can, you can really build it in and kind of make it robust as far as the different types of questions you can ask. It's not necessarily Jeopardy style, but it's kind of flag driven as well by they have to go into Kibana, find the source IP, find the destination ports, find the hashes for this file. Um, how many other machines were accessed after the RCE, RCE uh, one compromise? So now we're talking lateral movement. They gotta go and look and see what touched other machines around it right after the time frame that that happened uh, with the initial compromise. Um, what domain account was used to access the, the other machines? Uh, so then you'd have to dig into your logs and find, you know, what actual service account was used to uh, laterally move to other machines within the environment. Um, and all that data is there. Um, one other cool thing I did was uh, I created an insider threat lane where I uh, I built a a virtual Raspberry Pi image and I put it in the in the virtual environment and put a changed the MAC address on it so it looked like a Raspberry Pi, and then I just fired up Responder on it and let it run and just start start stealing, uh, you know the the traffic replies and you're just getting all these sweet NTLM hashes coming across and all this stuff, but it's all being logged. All of it's being logged down to the file names that that are that are being touched. So it's great. You can see everything. Um, another one was an exfiltration lane where there were certain files on these machines that would go and get accessed, and like I'd use like PSCP to copy them off the box to a new machine out in the public internet space, and that was like the final straw. You know, like PSCP touched this undisclosed product defects or something file that, you know, is probably proprietary company information that you don't want to get out there. Um, and then you have a log file showing PSCP touch this file and it then created a network connection out to 209 dot blah, blah, blah. And that's like the final thing that happened in the, in the scenario, right? It happened, started with a eternal seven or eternal blue Windows seven compromise, laterally moved to other things, finally exfiltrated our data and all of those pieces have to be filled in. They all have answers like what file was actually touched, what file was stolen from the system, and they actually have to plug in the file name in the CTFD for them to get the right answer. Um, so that's kind of cool. You don't necessarily have to turn this into a CTF, though, if you're just trying to use it as a detection lab. Um, all you would need to do is set it up similarly to where you have your public simulated boundary, you have your port mirrors, and then you just mix and match. You open up what you want to open up and you send it to where you want to send it to. Um, this could also be done with Linux or I'm sure you could do it with a physical setup with Cisco or something like that. Um, I just happen to choose OpenBSD because I'm super comfortable with it and it's really easy to work with. Um, but Anyway, I think that's about it. Um, are there any questions? How much time do I have? Yes, sir. Nope, it's all live. And it does. Just the, the normal chatter of the network will generate about Oh, about 800,000 logs a day in a completely isolated, non-internet connected environment. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes, sir.
Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it's ESXi 6.5. Yeah. I haven't got up to 6.7 yet, but 6.5 is what I use for this setup. Yes, sir. Um, so as part of the course, they would have to build like different dashboards, like um, you know, um, standard services and, and stuff to to first baseline, kind of baseline the system, and then anything outside of that would um, pop up, sort of. Yes, absolutely. Yep. We started them off real slow and kind of handheld them and. Step by step, go build this, go into here, create this query, um, add it to a visualization, add that visualization to this dashboard, and like really held their hands through the beginning of it. And then at once they get to this point, they're expected to use all that stuff that they learned to tackle the CTF. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you very much for having me.